we all know our movement is blessed to have a president and first lady who truly understand the importance and power of service. That's why the Kennedy Serve America Act got enacted so quickly in the first 100 days. And from Martin Luther King Day even before they took office to the United We Serve campaign that's getting launched today in conjunction with this conference, the President and First Lady have continued to call on all of us to serve. And they're elevating service as a core ideal of citizenship in our democracy. But that sort of commitment requires leadership and planning and forethought. And I'm so pleased to introduce our next speaker, who has been at the center of the President's agenda for service from the very beginning. Melody Barnes is the President's domestic policy advisor and the director of the White House Domestic Policy Council. And she's an inspired leader in her own right. Melody got her start in public service selling cupcakes to support George McGovern's 1972 campaign when she was eight years old. And we know her cupcakes did better than that campaign. She says that her interest in politics and government started as a young girl through her love of history when she would read biographies and study the issues of the day. And it's in her DNA because her mom worked as a teacher and her father worked as a civilian with the Army. So she has roots in this movement. Melody received her degree in history from UNC and her law degree from the University of Michigan. Over the years, Melody has worked on very important issues, including civil rights and voting rights, women's health, and religious liberties. She served as eight years as Senator Kennedy's chief counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee. So we know that the Kennedy Serve America Act has a special place in her heart, and we know she worked hard on that to get it done. She also served as executive vice president at the Center for American Politics. And in addition to the president's work on service and social innovation, Melody's deeply engaged in the president's agenda on health care and education and all of the key domestic issues facing the country. Somehow, despite what must be the world's most overstuffed inbox, Melody found time to get married just a little over a week ago. So Melody, a hearty congratulations. And we so appreciate that so soon after your wedding, you made time to share your vision with all of us in the service movement. Please join me in welcoming Melody Barnes. This is a honeymoon, isn't it? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank you so much for having me here. And for those of you who see this binder, don't worry. This isn't the whole speech. This is the whole day. So, <laughs> um, so good afternoon to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here. And before I talk about service and talk about the work that we have going on at the White House and the ways that we want to partner with you, I am compelled to thank a few people in the room um, as well as all of you. I mean, first of all, I want to thank Alan for that wonderful introduction and for inviting me to be here today. It is a real pleasure. And as you know, his organization, Be the Change, along with the Points of Light Institute and CEO Michelle Nunn, made today's forum possible. So we're all indebted to both of them for their hard work and for their leadership and for their service. So thank you so much, Alan. And then I've got another Alan I want to thank. Um, and you really have to think long and hard about how you begin to thank Alan Solomon for his work. And he is a committed advocate for active citizenship and service and a dedicated public servant himself. And Alan has done such a superb job as chairman of the Corporation for National and Community Service. And I want to thank him for all of his work and for his leadership and for his guidance. Um, starting during the transition when we were, we were sitting in that tiny little office and talking about the work here and the work to be done in the future. So thank you so much, Alan. And now I, I need to thank you. And I want to thank you all and honor your commitment to service. You are leaders and examples to the wider world. You have dedicated your lives to lifting up our common interests and enabling and energizing others to do the same. I want to thank you for all the hard work that you do for, and all the hard work that the organizations that you represent do. You have helped shape the community, um, sort what community service is today, and are building what it will become. Indeed, you are the change. You are the change. And the President stands with you in working to ensure that every American 
every man, woman, and child engages in volunteerism and service in the manner of their cho choosing from childhood well into their senior years. So thank you so much for all the work that you've done. And I know earlier, yeah, give yourself a hand. <laughs> we just heard from that wonderful panel, and I know earlier you also heard from Laisha Ward of the Target Foundation and Shannon Schuyler of the PricewaterhouseCoopers Foundation who remind us that it takes many to do the work that we are doing today. It takes government, it takes philanthropic organizations, businesses, and individuals to meet the needs of our communities. Like you, I have a good sense of what that commitment to service looks like. Did you know that in the White House, you can get breakfast, lunch, dinner, a snack, every day, including the weekend, just to make sure that you can stay in your office and stay committed to doing the service that's so important. But I think all of you, and I share with all of you the fact that my colleagues and I understand what it means to do this work and it takes passion and it takes dedication and it takes hard work and rolling up your sleeves, but it is a, a, a passion that gives its return to you over and over and over again. And in fact, I know for all of us here, it is life work that we couldn't imagine doing anything otherwise. But no two people exemplify this better than our extraordinary president and first lady, who have both been long committed to public service. And they've told us the importance of their service experiences and how that has changed their lives. And we know how those experiences have made them role models for millions of Americans. I think you all know the president started his career as a community organizer on the south side of Chicago. And the first lady started Public Allies at Chicago, which is an AmeriCorps program. There are very real examples that service is, that it must be more than a one-off event. It should be a lifelong commitment to engaging one's community, whether at a neighborhood, city, state, or federal level. The challenges we face today are greater than ever before. Since day one in office, the president has been focused on investing in areas that will create new jobs and lasting prosperity. But he knows that government alone cannot do this, that America's economic recovery is not just about what we do in Washington, but equally about what each of us, each of you do in your communities. He has asked all of us as individuals and as organizations to take an active role in the state of our nation and the improvement of our fellow citizens' lives through service. Your work embodies a commitment to getting this country back on the right track. Even before the president took office, he made service a centerpiece of his inauguration. His initiative, Renew America Together, connected potential volunteers with service needs in their communities. And on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, the day before the president's inauguration, over 13,000 service projects were completed. That's 13,000 service projects across the nation. In the 14 years that the King holiday has been recognized as a national day of service, that was the largest turnout ever. And as you're clapping, I hope you're clapping for yourselves because you, in no small part, are responsible for that turnout. The work that you did in your communities made up the composite that turned that into such a wonderful day and such an outpouring of feeling and a commitment to service. Your active support for ex expanded service opportunities also helped secure what we've been talking about today, the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act. The new law benefits us all by creating opportunities to serve for students, seniors, and everyone in between, by engaging our country's greatest resource, our citizens, and by providing new opportunities to leverage and scale innovative ideas to solve our nation's most pressing problems. I was really proud and touched, and I, for those of you, and I know several of you who were there when the president signed that bill into law, you probably shared with me that feeling of tears coming to my eyes when back in April the president signed the legislation into law. And it's a bill that lifts up all of our values and the value of service, which has been so integral, as Alan said, to my own career path. 
You know, many years ago, when I was fresh out of law school, I went to New York to serve as a junior associate as a law, at a law firm um, in the city. And it was very exciting, um, but after being there for just a week, I knew I had to pursue a different challenge, a different calling. It was, in fact, my calling, and to invest my life quite differently. I had found corporate finance and bank regulatory law to be intellectually interesting in law school, and I know that's hard to believe, but I, I really did. Um, and it was stimulating, but I couldn't help but look and look around and think, and I, I don't know if all of you remember Ross Perot and his, his famous running mate, Admiral Stockdale, and that great line, <laughs> that great line in the debate when he said, you know, who am I and why am I here? And that's kind of the feeling I had after being at the firm for a little while. You know, I, <laughs> I learned a great deal in my early days there, and those lessons have served me quite well over the years, but it was engaging with people and engaging in communities through public service that has been the most rewarding career path that I could have imagined for myself. And so I had the honor and the good fortune to work for and learn from Senator Kennedy. And he's a great public servant whose life is an ongoing story of service and whose work continues to transform the nation. So it was only appropriate that his colleague and friend from across the aisle, Senator Hatch, offered the amendment to ensure that the National Service Bill was graced with Senator Kennedy's name. It was the bipartisan leadership of those two men, as well as their colleagues in the House of Representatives, that made this legislation possible and expanded opportunities to serve so dramatically and proved that service is a nonpartisan endeavor. We also know that you did much to raise the profile of the service agenda and secure that broad bipartisan coalition so that the bill could be passed quickly when the president decided the time was right to push it, and he did that within the first 100 days of his administration. So thank you for the work that you did to make that possible and to make sure that service remains a national priority. But as much as we've already accomplished, I think we all know that the hard work lies ahead. First, we need your help again. And this time it's to ensure that the support that was authorized for the corporation in the Serve America Act is in fact appropriated. And I think this is something that you all have been talking about already and will continue to talk about um, in the days to come. We need to take steps to strengthen the corporation for national and community service and put it on the path to support the enormous growth in its core programs, AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, and Learn and Serve. We need to move forward with the efforts to support social innovation. The appropriations process for the $50 million Social Innovation Fund is underway. The fund is necessary to provide seed funding for innovative new ideas, to lever leverage federal dollars so that we can identify and grow solutions to our most pressing, intractable community problems. Second, I want to thank you in advance for participating in the President's Call to Service, which we call United We Serve. I know we can count on every single person in this room. I know many of you have already been engaged with us in this endeavor, because starting today, June 22nd, and running all the way through September 11th, a National Day of Service and Remembrance, United We Serve will catalyze partnerships with nonprofits, foundations, citizens, and corporations to make progress on our nation's greatest challenges. This summer is an opportunity to engage episodic volunteers in sustained service, to help harness their energy and patriotism, to help ordinary people do extraordinary things, to empower ourselves and make our communities stronger. United We Serve is being run by the Corporation for National and Community Service, the corporation's website, and Jonathan was just talking about this, the corporation's website, serve.gov, will be the hub of this effort. On serve.gov, Americans can find service opportunities in their communities and get the tools they need to organize themselves, identify the needs of their communities, and act creatively to fill them. United We Serve is an opportunity to change the way service is talked about in this country. We will not think solely in terms of our served, but instead in terms of the measurable impact of our service. That's why we focused on the four core areas of our recovery agenda for the summer service opportunities. We focused on the big, tough problems facing our country today. Education, healthcare, 
energy conservation and community revitalization. Drawing on the lessons and successes from the President's Internet Savvy Campaign, we have launched a new web tool at serve.gov that will connect people to service opportunities in the way that Jonathan was describing, and use social networking tools to connect people interested in similar problems and activities. We've posted toolkits on serve.gov to help volunteers develop a project plan and other, organize other or volunteers around it. Projects can range from those aimed at preventing summer learning loss, like book drives and reading to young children, to starting a community garden, and I think we all know how popular gardening has become in the last few months, and that will encourage healthy eating habits, at habits and a greener community. Here is why we need your help right away. We need your energy and your talents. We need you to post your service opportunities on serve.gov because volunteers are more likely to sign up to serve and remain engaged if they have a breadth of opportunities to choose from. And we need you to remind your members to share their stories of success with us there as well. I know Ariana was talking about that fabulous project that they have. So Put, add your stories to Ariana's um, website, add them to this website, and let's talk to the country about the power of service and what that means, and not just the quantitative, but also the qualitative meaning of service, how it changes your life and how it changes the lives of the people that we are in fact serving. And tell everyone about the great work that we're able to do. Today is the first day of the United We Serve project, and this conference is just the beginning for us. The President is committed to investing in ideas and solutions that meet today's challenges and in the people that are working hard in their communities to make a difference. But let me acknowledge the challenges that are involved in this work, issues that reflect the ongoing challenges that we must confront and address as a community together. It's not going to be easy to change the level and nature of service in America. We know that you have been asked to step up over and over and over again and to be a part of these efforts. And we know that in these tough economic times, it's a strain on resources. We're going to have to work together to determine how and where you'll get those resources while you're also building the capacity to meet the growing demand for increased participation. We know, I mean, over the course of the two years of the campaign, you could feel it building and building and building. People who had at one point been turned off are now suddenly engaged and are answering that call to serve, and they're turning to you to look for ways to do it. So we have to think about the ways to build capacity and that the government can be a partner along with the private sector, with the philanthropic sector, to make this possible and to make it robust. We need to think collectively and creatively about the best ways to increase capacity, what's worked in the past, and how government can be most helpful and productive in the future. This amazing moment in history also affords us the opportunity to further diversify the national service community. I don't know about you, but I do still feel that energy for the, from the two years of the campaign and certainly over the last several months that I spent on the campaign. There was that excitement that swept across the country. Americans want to serve. They want to be part of the solution to the complex challenges that face us. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to broaden our community, to expand in cities and suburbs, but also engage people who are living in rural America, to bring greater racial and ethnic diversity to our ranks. Our already powerful movement can be even more so if we embrace those challenges and achieve our goals. And it's all within our grasp. Working together, we are certain to succeed. You and the organizations that you represent have a track record of excellence. You've proven time and time and time again that you are willing and able to transform lives, to improve communities, and to, in fact, change history. So in closing, I want to thank you again for the work you did before this administration began and in the last 154 days. Your efforts fuel the progress that we've made thus far, and it is your commitment and hard work that will make the Edward M. Kennedy Serve America Act, United We Serve, and Serve.gov, as well as all of our future endeavors, a success. So I want to thank you again for having me here today, and I look forward to walking this journey and doing this work with all of you. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Melody. It was terrific. We are so blessed to have your leadership right at the top of our nation's government. And Melody has time for just a couple of questions if anybody wants to, to uh, share your thoughts or ask her about the president's agenda going forward. Or if you've got ideas. We really, really yes, right love here. to hear them. Great. Just stand up and say who you are and go ahead. National Youth Service Organization called the Student Conservation Association, if you didn't hear me. But, you know, it's obvious that um, opportunities for service are growing and the interest is growing. But at the same time, I think not only at the state level, but also at the federal level, the uh, sort of the, the, the obstacles to doing so, the administrative obstacles to working within with agencies, the, the clouding of sort of cooperative agreements with um, more traditional business type contracts uh, are making it increasingly difficult to actually put those people in the field. So I just ask that uh, at the same time we're, we're trying to grow these opportunities that we, that we look at, at reducing the obstacles to actually making it happen on the ground. Because all but the, really all but the largest of organizations can, can break through it. I mean, it, it's, it's a pretty daunting, a pretty daunting task. So. Uh, we'll work, we pledge to work with you and just ask that you look at that, that no, issue. Absolutely, and thank you for that question. I, my guess is that there are a number of people in the room who share that ca same concern and have had those same set of experiences. And one of the things that we did during the transition and after the president had asked me to take on this role, and I was working with my colleagues, um, Carlos Monhe, Carlos, wave, <laughs> um, and Michelle Jolin, I don't know if Michelle is in the room, and Sonal Shaw. Um, and we're working with Jonathan and others as well, we started thinking about the importance of this work, and because it was so important, we created in the Domestic Policy Council an Office of Social Innov Innovation and Civic Engagement. And one of the purposes of that office is to think about the ways that we can change the policy environment to make it easier for national service to, to prosper and to flourish, and to think about the relationship between the cousins that are national service and social innovation, neither one overshadowing each other, but how they can work together. So again, we want to hear your ideas, we want to hear the specifics, but that's the, the purpose of that office, and we are working with very eager, very active, and very engaged secretaries uh, and agency heads from across the administration, people who have worked with not-for-profits and worked in this community before, so they understand just how important it is and are quite receptive to the kinds of ideas um, that you and others may have. So bring us those ideas so that we can learn from what's going on in the field, and we will begin the process of trying trying to make this environment um, more, make it easier for you to do your work. Terrific, yes. One last question here, Liz. The first is Habitat for Humanity has a model of um, partnering with our partner families and it's a hand up, not a hand out. Mm -hmm. And we are blessed to have wonderful experiences um, at the workplace, including people getting married and having wonderful real life experiences because of the commitment and joy of being in service. But part of that is because I think we try very hard to dignify um, those receiving the service. Absolutely. And I was wondering what it was in your public policy that you were doing to try to help um, elevate and dignify the service so that the experience is more balanced and more rewarding for both the giver and the receiver? That's a great question. Uh, and that's something I know that all of us have been thinking about. And as we've been thinking about, and as I mentioned in my remarks, diversifying this movement. And you know, we talk about um, what that looks ge like ge geographically and racially and ethnically in terms of um, so socioeconomic um, uh, barriers and bringing everyone in. And I know from the work that I've done on a policy level that it's important not just, as you said, not just a I, I can't describe it as, we, as well as the, you did, but ensuring that you're bringing everyone in and, in fact, the people who are benefiting from the service because those are often the best advocates for the work that we're doing. So that's something that we're thinking about um, very seriously within my office, also as we work with, with those at the corporation, um, and as we build on the Serve America Act and we're expanding the Serve America Act, um, because of the Serve America Act, that's something that we have to weave into the work that we are doing. I know from some of the organizations that I've worked with in the past, as we've thought about advocacy, we've thought of, we've 
encouraged and worked with those who have included those who are benefiting from the advocacy in the advocacy process. And that's something that we definitely want to see um, be a part of the service, the service movement um, and the social innovation movement as well. Uh, I saw Marsha Meeks Kelly, who has been such an extraordinary leader in the service movement from Mississippi. She has a quick question, and we'll close out with Marsha. Um, and I would love to see us take this message in a way that gets to the grassroots. And how do we get this into town halls across the country so that this conversation is, is relevant and alive? And, and in Mississippi, maybe they don't all, you know, we might not all have Twitter. But, but how do we get the conversations into a place that, uh, that people are really, we have vexing issues. Yes, we've dealt with Katrina, but, and we're still dealing with those. But how do we take something that it profoundly changed people's lives here, as we've heard earlier, and that, and that we bring it into the, you know, the political, uh, I mean, this is, this is a campaign. So, so how do we get this into real conversations in, in real neighborhoods is, would be a thought. Absolutely. I think we have two of the most powerful advocates in the country, if not in the world in terms of the president and the first lady. Who are so firm, so resolute in their commitment to this issue. I can assure you when this is discussed in the White House, it isn't you know, a one-off or how can we you know, lob some service onto something else we're doing. It sits at the center and at the core and it has the attention of the president, the first lady, of Ram, of my other senior staff colleagues. Um, and that you will see, I promise you, over the course of the next few weeks and months, very active, engaged, public discussion of national service and social innovation in ways that brings the country into this conversation, that talks about you know, service going forward in a new way, in terms of impact, in terms of drawing people in who haven't necessarily been in, involved in service before, and not just doing it um, in the neighborhoods where we've already been participating, but looking for ways to go out and using different kinds of tools, you know, whether, you know, for some that's Twitter and Facebook, for other that's, you know, faith-based organizations and in community organizations, meeting people where they live and talking to them and engaging them in national service. Um, so we will have the President and the First Lady committed to doing that, certainly the Corporation for National, um, national and Community Service, the organizations that you all participate in and ways that we can engage with you. And again, for, for us in the Domestic Policy Council uh, in the White House, the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Engagement is a hub in the White House where we are constantly looking for ways to drive not only this message out, but this work out. Because, and I'll close by saying this, it isn't just the act of service. This is a means to an end. This is about impact. This is about changing communities. It's about changing the country. It's about changing the world. We have to engage everyone in this activity if we're going to confront these really intractable, tough problems that we face. And we know that people want to be engaged, that they feel more in touch with their government, with their communities, that they feel more empowered. I am changing my community for my children, for my grandchildren, for myself, if they're engaged in this activity. So we, I think, will be talking to a very willing and engaged audience we, it is our responsibility, and we take this on as a serious responsibility in the White House, to go out and do that work. So we are committed to it, and I think what you will find in the weeks to come is that we are doing that full force. Thank you so much.